Okie dokie. Okie dokie. Here we are. Okie dokie. Yeah, I am super pumped to have you here, Tammy. So we'll get, we'll let folks get situated here, kind of uh, uh, trickling in here before we get get started. But um, do you have any, do you have any travel coming up at all? Yeah, um, a week from Monday, 10 days from today, we're going to Cabo, my family and I. Amazing. Can't wait. Uh, can't wait to, to get out there. Just need a break. And over Thanksgiving is perfect because you don't have to check your email as much. Yeah. You can, you can really relax. Are you guys on, uh, is launched Darkly on a calendar year or a fiscal year? No, we're one month offset. So Salesforce, think, uh, so <laughs> January 31st is the end of our uh, end of our fiscal year. Wonderful. Yes, us too. Because that's yeah, the, the next thing is like, will the will Christmas through uh, will Christmas through uh, New Year's be a mad dash of insanity, or will you actually be able to like hang out with uh, with the family at all? And well, uh, thing shuts down. And don't you love that fiscal year, Pete? I mean, you oh guys my gosh. Have yeah. Well, I mean, like, yes. <laughs> I mean, we don't have as nearly um, as as large ASP as uh, as your as your team, but like for whatever reason, we still have like some pretty pretty substantially backloaded quarters. Um, I need to get probably because our sales leader, this guy, needs to get his act together uh, uh, better on uh, on on driving linearity on the on the team. But uh, having that like huge lump at the end of the calendar year versus like on Jan January is. Uh, it's like stress on stress on stress. So yeah, I got a, I got a pitch. I got a, a tip for you there. Please, please, okay, so please, about, coach. Yeah. So about two quarters ago, I decided that the end of the quarter was, and I picked it. So this um, quarter, the end of the quarter is January thirty first. So all of my reps get their bonuses, but only if they make their number by January thirty first or twenty first. Mm -hmm. Sorry. Twenty first. Wow. Yes. Okay. One of the quarter up. So basically, it means that no deals in Salesforce can have a close date of January thirty first. Um, and if you don't make your, you have until January 21st to make your number in order to get your quarterly bonus. Wow. And Got it's it. and this, really effective. And lo and behold, a bunch of those deals have been showing up earlier. Weird. And they show up earlier. Now, now last quarter we had like six deals slip, but you know what? I think if the reps would have been positioning in October, no. October 31st close. Yeah. yeah. October 31st close that they all would have slipped into November. The deals that we said slipped actually slipped to the last week of the quarter, not to a new quarter. Yeah. Yeah. Got it. Yes. It's the, uh, the kind of like uh, cat and mouse game associated with like dealing with sandbagging and urgency and rep incentive incentivizing uh, never a dull moment, but that's why uh, that, that's why enterprise sales leaders make the big bucks. Um, Okay, so let's let's go ahead and get started here. Uh, I'm really excited to have um, a absolutely fantastic guest here today. We'll get into a little bit more here in a uh, in a second here, but um, this is another uh, episode, if you will, of uh, Modern Sales Power Hour. I'm Pete Kazanji, and um, just for folks that kind of familiarize themselves with uh, Goldcast, this is our event platform right here. It makes for a lot of really great interactivity, which is the whole point of this because we have an illustrious uh, sales leader here to to kind of drop knowledge and answer your questions live. Uh, in the side panel, there's a Q&A thing. See, I'm pointing at it right now through my, my camera. There's a Q&A panel over there. You can submit questions via text there or video questions, um, leverage that because the whole idea here is that we have this wonderful wealth of knowledge in the form of Tammy Sexton, uh, enterprise sales leader at LaunchDarkly here. And I know a couple things, but really Tammy's the show here today. Um, and so we're, this is all about answering questions there. Um, for folks who are not familiar, uh, maybe joining us for the first time, uh, Power Hour is a production of Modern Sales. Uh, MSP, Modern Sales Pros, MSP is the world's largest revenue leadership community for the folks in sales management, sales and revenue operations, sales development, and related disciplines. Uh, the whole mission of the community is to create an environment for our 25,000 members to answer the questions that they would struggle to answer on their own and kind of help them see around corners. And that's literally what we're doing today is like, hey, I have this question around, you know, champion development or like, you know, uh, decision criteria influence or whatever. Hey, guess what? We could get that answered right here by, by an expert there. Um, 
so we do aside from aside from just this msp does a bunch of really great other events as well we do virtual experiences we have a robust online forum and also we do really great on uh, offline uh, events in the form of our of our salons. Um, so just kind of a couple things before we get started here. Um, so this is a unique format. It's not like a couple talking heads here, um, just kind of opining on on whatever. Um, rather, what we're what we're doing here is we're we're really trying to d dig into specific question, like tactical questions um, that and problems that people have that that Tammy and myself can kind of help you help you solve. Some people have submitted questions ahead of time and we'll get into that. But the whole idea here is for us to like get into the nitty gritty of your of your problems um, and 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 help answer and help help answer those those questions. Um, and so kind of without any further ado, what I'd love to do is um, have Tammy introduce her herself. I kind of noted earlier she's an enterprise sales leader at LaunchDarkly, but but Tammy, you have a storied sales uh, leadership career. Maybe you can give um, folks a little bit of rundown of of kind of what that's been over the last like few uh, few roles. Sure. So I started out at PTC, as you probably uh, pointed out, as you pointed out earlier, and spent some time at EMC and then thought I, I really actually like the startup world. So I've been with Sumo Logic, Danger Duty right before they went public, Sumo before they yeah. went public, and now Launch Darkly. Um, current title is actually um, VP of North American. I actually inherited the uh, corporate sales uh, group. So oh, fun. Group. Yep. So I'll, I'll, I'll get to try my hand at managing the, the high velocity, um, velocity. Sales here, which is going to be fun. Oh, wow. That's, um, wow. That will be exciting because yeah. it's like, it's like keeping two languages in your brain at the same time because like the what are the i mean like what are the round parameters of like the the asp and, and deal cycle on the end side versus commercial side i imagine they're probably pretty substantially different there they are yeah so we view a corporate sales account as less than a thousand employees on linkedin so yep. And, and you know their ASP is about eighteen thousand. The ASP in the the enterprise wow. uh, space is eight, about sixty. And then our strat accounts, which is like the larger, you know, the IBM and Microsofts of the world, you know, they're they can get they can go to be to be seven figures easily. So this will yep. be a whole different area. I can kind of add to my expertise. I'm really looking forward to it. That'll be really interesting. We'll have to have you back to talk about that like in six months because I know. I, I was having this like e text message argument with one of our board members last night, last night, um, as one does, right? Yeah. About med med pick applicability to um, down market down market sales motions, and I was advancing the claim that it's something that's more like enterprise centric, and he was like, "No, you're full of crap. Like it's something. It's just it's like buyer. It's it's all about buyer centricity." And that can be applied in, um, you know, that can be applied at a, you know, at a 10K or a 20K, a 10, 20K transaction, as long as there's, you know, uh, a bunch of different criteria going on. And I was like, oh, okay, well, and then, and now you're going to be applying that there. So actually, one of the questions that somebody brought up earlier, and like, we can talk about this is, like, what is the, the sales methodology that you guys have deployed there at LaunchDarkly? And then how have you gone about, um, kind of deploying that? Uh, sure. So, you know, as a former PTC employee, uh, obviously it's, it's magic. I'm, a, I'm yep. a big John McMahon fan. If you know who John is, I, I he, oh, was, yeah. he was my first sales leader. So, uh, oh, when wow. he, yeah, when he wrote um, the, here it is, the qualified, the qualified sales leader. It's like my Bible. I keep it with me. It's a great uh, book. Yeah. I actually asked him to come on one of my team calls uh, and oh, wow. about what, this is when the book first came out. In fact, he texted me and he's like, will you read this and put some comments if you like it on LinkedIn? And I'm like, well, sure, yep. sure for you, anything. And uh, it actually, it, MedPick is uh, to me by far the most superior sales methodology out there for enterprise and strat. And we'll see about um, corporate. I don't know what yeah. to say about that yet. <laughs> how do, so how do you guys have that like deployed right now? Like this, because I think a lot of people here, um, you know, here like medic or medpick or or what have you, and like they they know about these these notions by like they know about them like like they're cognizant of them, but they don't necessarily know how to reduce it to practice. Like, how do you like do you guys have various fields on the opportunity? Are you doing it in some sort of other solution where you're you know you're making sure that people are authenticating their medpick criteria? How do you guys like tactically do that? 
Yeah, I, it's ironic you should bring that up. I'm actually in a, in a little bit of a, we're in transition right now. So we uh -huh. put all the fields in Salesforce. The problem with fitting, yep. putting the fields in Salesforce is if you go like E, you know, economic buyer, and the rep puts in, you know, Joe Smith. And and yep. that, that doesn't really tell me anything. If you look at what the economic buyer, the reason that's part of MedPick isn't yep. do you know who the economic buyer is, is have you been in front of the economic buyer? Has the economic right. buyer said they were going to buy? Have they committed to your timeline? So yep. I'm actually in the process of working right now, trying to work right now uh, with our, our Salesforce admins to not just have like economic buyer blank, but actually have a sliding scale saying, pick one of these. Like mm -hmm. I know, so zero points means you don't even know who EB is. One is, you know who EB is, but I've never met with them. Maybe mm -hmm. a three is you've met with the economic buyer. Um, and a five is like, you've met with EB, they confirmed they're going to buy, they confirmed timeline and you have a follow-up meeting and then everything in MedPick will actually be weighted for a final MedPick score. So you can right. actually start, MedPick is not about a letter and then a blank, economic buyer blank. It's not what it is. Yeah. It's a, it's about like weighting, like weighting the probability and, and identifying risk and like gaps and yeah. I, I love the I love the fact that you have that <laughs> book sitting right there and and having a unified way by which to discuss deals as opposed to just like, yeah, it's going great, right? Like here, let me tell you a story about it, right? Like which obviously reps are really good at telling stories. Um, so so you're gonna do waiting on each of the med pick fields. What would be some of the other like in the case of, Yeah, I was gonna say I'm like, oh, this is making my mind spin like what would be the different weightings of like metric? Like, like for example, oh, metric. Um, zero being I don't know, right? Maybe you yeah. get a three if you've got some idea. Like I, they, I know that this company wants to go from two releases a month to five releases a week. They want to go from twice a month to daily, right? That yeah. might be a three. You get a five if you say that going from two releases a month to releasing daily is going to have this impact on their business. They believe sure. that they can double the rate of innovation if they go from this to this. To this. That's a, a full met metric. And like for like um, champion, like I have a champion uh, yep. spreadsheet yep. that all the reps have to fill out and it has things on it. Like, do you have their phone number? Have you text them? Can you, I think yep. we talked about this last time, right? Have you swore? Yep. Cause if they swear and you swear, it's like a whole little, little level of like, Ooh, we're, we're getting chummy now. Right. But we're buddies. Yeah. For buddies and then if your buddies you can ask them questions like if you install our product and it's successful what does that mean for you do you get a promotion what happens um so so champion in in salesforce for us right now it's a blank right but what i want it to be coming you know i'm working with sales ops is yep. put your champion score here and depending yep. upon your champion score you get all 20 points for that category because all the categories are not worth the same amount right champions sure. worth a lot more than um, and then, you know, it gives you an overall score, which I think can actually play into our forecasting as well. We can use that score to say the health of the deal is this. Definitely. That's a really fascinating thing, because I think one of the things that's kind of funny with these sales methodologies, like everybody, they all kind of have their own clever little acronym, which is great because you want to be able to remember them. But the problem is, is that like every like word kind of feels the same weight because it's like part of an acronym or what have you. But as you point out, like you could know the metric, you could know all, you know, all these different things, the decision criteria. And if you don't have a champion, you're still kind of host. Right. Mm -hmm. So yeah. when you think like, when you think about um, like the different kind of components of, um, of MedPick there, um, what, like, what are the top three most important um, criteria that like, obviously champion is worth like 20 in your, in your estimation here. What would be the other ones that are like super, like super powered? Pain mm -hmm. and EB. Yep. And I, I would have to say either between EB or decision criteria, like John says in his book, control the decision criteria, control the deal. If you feel right. like the decision criteria is then being like leaning towards something else that isn't you know, something that's a highlight of your product versus like a competitive product, you've lost yep. control of your deal. Yep. Yep. Got it. Well, so yeah, let's talk about economic buyers um, because I think one of the things that reps oftentimes will like screw up is like, um, and actually we'll get to Louis' question here in a section, in a sec a second, but like, they'll talk about like, oh yeah, the DM, the DM, the DM. And it's like, whoa, 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 whoa. like what genre 
what genre of decision maker are we talking about here? Are we talking about like an influencer? Are we talking about a business user? Or are we talking about an economic buyer? And I think John does a really good job in the book talking about like a very crisp de definition of the economic buyer, which I'm going to try to not screw up, but I think essentially what it, what it is, it's the person who has the power to to, to disperse discretionary funds. You, that's right? 100% correct. The economic buyer yeah. has use of discretionary funds. Yeah, exactly. And so the what what's I think the thing that kind of like addles rep brains, like I had this recently in one of our deals where the rep was like, Oh yeah, you know, the SVP of sales is like totally in, like, you know, I've gotten a verbal commitment from from him on this timeline right here. But then it actually turned out that even though the SVP of sales had this like highfalutin title, that he was not the the economic buyer because the person who actually like you know went through NetSuite and said yes okay you know authorize the po or whatever was this like business operations person uh over here and it actually elongated the deal cycle by like like 30 days it was yeah. super annoying but it like and the rep was like i don't get it i don't get it um and it's like but, so i think the one of the things that you we were kind of noting that has been on your radar recently is like how do you get in front of the economic buyer early and then how do you and then how do you persist a relationship with them throughout the, the arc of the deal? So what are you like, how are you coaching your reps to do that? So obviously, you know, as your champion score goes up, you have the right then when your champion score is high enough to ask the champion to introduce your boss or your whoever you want, right, to the economic buyer. Um, it's not yeah. always gonna be something that they're gonna be like, it all depends upon how strong your champion is and how much yeah. they want your product, right? But then yep. I also encourage my reps, like there's a, there's different ways. Like we have a two week POV here, two week um, uh, trial. Yep. And yep. we have customers who say, I need a, a month trial. Great. You can have a month trial, but that's going to require me to get my executives in front of your executives because we want to make sure that any investment in time that we make in you, we, we, we have the hope of doing business at the end. And then as a rep, you can look at your champion and just say, I don't have control over this. Like, I just can't get it done. Like, don't make it you asking them, make it like this is... Or customers want, um, you know, an unreasonable IP uh, uh, limitation of liability, right? Great. We're going to meet with, and in a perfect world, you're meeting with the, the economic buyer before your POV and you're yeah, walking yeah. with your executives and you're starting with those pain slides. Hey, Mr. EB, this is what I heard from members of your team. And this is how it's affecting your business. Would you agree with that? To get them talking right, right. before your executives talk to EB, because it's really important that they start with their pain. Um, there's a hundred ways to, to get to EB. Any anytime a customer asks us for anything, it's a reason to ask for something in exchange. It's like the trade, right? Because I think this is the, the challenge that reps will run into, especially when they're talking, when they're not like having a conversation at the what is it? What does John call it? The pain above the noise or something like uh, that? Yeah. I forget what it is. Above the noise. That's when you're talking yeah. to the business level. Yep. Yeah, exactly. Because exactly. like, there's, there's like product level, like, Hey, I've got like use lunch dark as an example, like, Oh man, you know, our existing um, release management is like janky or whatever. And it's like, it's kind of a pain in my butt. And we're talking about like features and kind of like, you know, practitioner pain and what have you, which is great. Right. Like obviously that has to exist, but, but like, it's kind of hard to talk that to a CFO or to a you know VP of engineering or you know a CIO or or what have you. And so I think the things that reps oftentimes struggle with is like how do I like I'm I'm down here, how do I even like facilitate that conversation? Like yes, I agree I should get in front of the economic buyer earlier, but how right. do I precipitate that? One thing is is like, oh, if they have an ask for us, but what about in a scenario where like they don't have an ask for us where we can't like we can't do a trade are there certain me like methods that you um, coach your reps on and like getting to that economic buyer and like up leveling that conversation earlier and earlier and earlier? Yeah. <laughs> Excuse me. To me, it's really about building your champion. Okay. And you know what? Once you get your champion to the point of what would it be like for your life if you implemented my product, right? And, and the hope is the champion's like, I, I love it. I want it. You know what? Yep. Here's an effective way to get it done. Let me get yep. my CTO in front of your CTO. So that like that like relation. So it's not, you're not asking yep. your champion to have you meet with EB. You're saying right. Let me, my CTO, we can give you some, you know, roadmap discussion about a lot of yep. whatever your product is. Um, yep. And you know what, if they really are your champion and they really do want your product, 
they have no reason. That's a great test. And if they fail and if they're like, nope, can't do that, that person's too busy, um, yeah. it just goes to show you that you probably shouldn't have it on commit, right? Right. It's like the, yeah. And th this is why, um, you know, qualification is not a one step process, right? It's like, it's not always be closing, it's always be qualifying, right? And so in that case, it's like, cool. Are you excited about this? And I'm going to champion test you. Yeah, this would be really transformative to me. W wonderful. Well, like, I sell a lot of launch darkly, and I can tell you exactly how it gets done. The next step here is for for us to get in front of your economic buyer. And the way we're going to do that is not me, this enterprise sales rep or, or whatever. But what we're going to do is we're going to have a carrot, which is like, hey, we're going to get this done for you, Mr. Mr. Customer, because you want to get this done. But we're going to give you this nice little carrot, which is roadmap or you know some sort of like executive relationship that's so that's really fascinating though because like you guys only have one cto right um or one vp or whatever um so so like how do you um yeah that's really fascinating like how do you how do you guard uh, like guard that resource and make sure that it's not being like pissed away yeah. willy nilly here or there you know john right Kodomo? i do him? yeah yeah and and uh and and well i'm i'm more friendly with edith but mm -hmm. um but yeah like um because presumably he's you know spending time with like the engineering team or what have you right i mean it's, yeah. it's an amazing move right like don't you want to don't you want to have executive pairing and like meet with the cta oh well i guess i would right but like you know it's it's like not cost free jo john's been phenomenal and what i ask of you know john and edith is just to you know, give the reps a couple time slots every month that they know they, they can book these. And if they need something outside of it, like John and Edith both have been amazing with their time. I, I couldn't be more happy with um, the, yeah. the way they do make themselves available. With that being said, you know, I like to, pe some people like to police that by deal size. So for example, your deal size might be over a hundred K if you want to access the executives. I sure. actually like to police things, and this is across the board a little bit differently. I like to look at total addressable market. So if it's IBM and we've got a deal for 25K, I'm accessing oh, yeah. John, I don't care what, right? But it, No problem. Another, this, is know, just, this is just one very small bite of the pie, and the pie exactly. is this big. <laughs> yes. And then sometimes right. we have a deal for 150K at some you know, very small company. And we know after that first deal, they're maxed out. Like they're not going to buy anything more unless we come out with a totally different product. So is that a good use of John's time or is the IBM deal for 25 grand a good use of John's time? Those are, I mean, oh man, Tammy, these are like great, great, great gems. So I think the, the, like some takeaways there is like one, do the exec pairing, right? Use it as that carrot to get in front of the, get in front of EB, right? And then the way to facilitate that and actually make sure that that happens is have those slots. One of the, the things that we talk about in my sales organizations, because I'm nuts, is uh, calendar is destiny. And so in this case, it's like, hey, let's calendar slots that are recurring, just sits there. And like, you get, I'm like, I think I want to start doing this for me, right? Where it's just like, here's a two hour block, like, you know, a couple times a month, or maybe it's like once a week or whatever, where it's a two hour block and it's like, you know, executive pairing time, yeah. right, for, for reps. And like, if it doesn't get used, congratulations, you just got a bunch of time back. You can do, you know, you can do email or you can like do whatever else. You can hop it's on the usually Peloton. Not, usually not a good sign when it doesn't get used. Oh, that's a, <laughs> yeah, exactly. Right. You can, if you could hop on, you, yeah, right. You can do email. The first email you're going to do is you're going to send it to your sales leader and be like, hey, why did this get used? Yeah, that's a very good, that's a very good point. Um, yeah. And you know, when you're sitting there with a customer and you got your champion and they're like, yeah, I think I would like to set that up. You know, you can say, how about you have visibility into your CTO's calendar? Would this work? Should I just send out an invite for this time? And just ask them because you know what? You want to strike while the iron's hot. And is, if course. you have their buy-in, don't rely on email and going back and forth with someone's admin if oh. you don't have to. Sometimes you can't get out of it. Yeah, why don't you just go ahead and bring up your calendar there? I imagine you you, you probably see his his calendar, right? Oh, yeah. Right. How's uh? I'm looking at I'm looking at my uh, my CTO's calendar right now. Like, let's let's go get this out. Yeah. yeah, I lo I love that. What um? So I think on um, it's funny we're talking about we're talking about CTOs who are like maybe <laughs> CTOs being involved in the deal cycle, which is maybe like the most grandiose example of like maybe a sales engineer here. But I know one thing that's um that's really like 
the case with launch darkly we don't have this problem but i know a lot of the people who are listening um do is like you guys have a really technical sale right like the modern continuous integration like um stack is like very very involved and like you have all these or like these organizations have like super hairy um you know service oriented architectures and what have you like what like what are some of the things that you do in order to drive like better like your aes and your se's playing nicely together whether it's like resource utilization you know um making sure the se's time is being used appropriately making sure that the aes are putting the correct stuff on the se's and not having them do stuff that the AEs should be doing how do you how do you guys approach that so we went through an exercise in q3 uh with a company to define roles and responsibilities and right. we're actually in the pro we're in the midst of changing our company from opportunity management to account management. And what I mean mm -hmm. by that is if I've got IBM, a $25,000 deal, right? In the yep. past, the rep would close the deal, they'd give it to customer success and say, call me if there's an upgrade, right? But that's really not the best. Um, that's not, so you really want to have that rep and the SC continue to be engaged. Um, from a technical perspective, what we have going for us, and I think that most companies do is like, our product is really technical, but it really isn't. Like I can actually demo, oh. I've got my own, I can demo launch darkly myself. So if I'm sitting on an airplane and I happen to be sitting next to the CTO or whatever, I can, if he goes, what's launch darkly? Or she goes, I'm like, let me show you. And it's, yeah. I think that um, my best reps actually are technical enough to be able to understand what launch darkly is, but I think the best reps, and this goes for any anybody across any industry, is taking yeah, something yeah. really technical and making it so a five year old can understand what it, what the, what they do. Because you know what, when that proposal goes up to for final signature at whatever account you're selling to, the CFO yep. doesn't know anything about feature flags. But what they do right. know is we've got to out innovate our competitors. So if you yep. can take that very complex thing. And, and break it down. And then sometimes I think it's actually to a sales rep's advantage that they're not that technical. Like sometimes on a discovery call, some sales reps invite their SEs to a discovery call, some, some go solo. I, I really don't have a preference either way. But one thing I do know is on that discovery call, making sure that the focus is the customer and the customer's pain and not a selling event is really, really important. So if the, if the customer asks a question and it is technical, the reps are, they make sure that the SE answers the question, but the, the, the goal of the SE is to answer it short, sweet, and then get back to the customer's pain. And it's not to continue on with launch sharply. Right, right. Like, did that answer that question? Yes, it did. Okay, great. Let's get back to how you want to transform your delivery mm -hmm. schedule and move to, you know, continuous integration as opposed to a waterfall delivery or whatever, yeah, or blah, 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 blah. Or that's a great question. It actually would be easier for me to show that in a demo. Do you mind if we table that and I'll make sure to bring it up? Great. Move on. Let's talk about your pain and let's talk about canary launch. And let's talk about continuous delivery and test and production and blah, blah, blah. So I think the, the my takeaway from that is like, just make sure that SEs don't like, and this isn't like, a, a, I'm not like talking crap here or whatever, like make sure that they don't take a discovery conversation and turn it into like a technical conversation. And so I think that's like a roles and responsibility thing where it's like, hey, look, I'm driving the business conversation here. I will like lateral things to you, execute it and then pop it back, pop it back to me. Where do the SEs then get involved and deployed um, in a more, in a deeper fashion? In well, the I mean, yeah, well, obviously, you know, the demo, but the goal of the demo is for the rep to start with the pain slides that they created as a result of the discovery call, right? Here's your current state. This here's is what I heard. Is. Yep, here's the, the, the future state, here's the benefits. And, and then the SE, it's a perfect segue for the SE to say, here are the technical requirements that you need to meet your future for your future state. Um, and then, you know, now let me start talking about launch darkly. Of course, you know, you start with the pain slides, the rep does the yep. pitch, then the, the SE gets right into, into the meat and potatoes of the whole, you know, platform. It, it, do you guys, is that how you guys do that? Because we have something similar where we have, um, <laughs> we have the most obnoxious name for this, this slide template. We call it a hot pocket. It's totally ridiculous. <laughs> um, that's our internal term, but it, we have this like hot pocket template of like, it's like eight slides or whatever. And the very first slide is pain points and kind of like required capabilities that like kind of tie to tie together there. Um, is that and this is like a Google this is like a Google slide that like our reps uh, fork off. We're probably going to start using some like dedicated mutual plan software for this. Um, one of my reps is like goofing around with that and kind of like uh, running with that evaluation. Um, 
do you got is that what you guys do too is you just have like a, a slide template or whatever and then the reps are supposed to like fill that out in order to guide the conversation from a pain sides perspective yeah 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 we're actually going through um as i told you i mean launch darkly is really transitioning like to big like enterprise real enterprise selling real strat selling it's taken a while right we're actually mm -hmm. going um we're doing some consulting in q1 around the, uh, I don't know if you've heard, heard a command of the message, but essentially that's what yep. we're doing in Q1. So we'll have templates right now. The pain slides the reps are presenting are all kind of, they all have their own version. I see. It's not, it's not where it needs to be, but it's going to be soon. Yeah. But they're doing it. It's maybe not harmonized, but at least someone's doing it. And if they're not doing it, Tammy Rose, some, Right. And, uh, <laughs> and, and so, and so in the future, it'll just be, it'll be more harmonized. Um, that makes sense. Well, um, so we were talking about like, e so on MedPick stuff, um, we talked about EB and kind of like the, the importance of and the importance of that. Um, the other thing too, though, is like, obviously Launch Darkly is like way out ahead of the market, um, but there's kind of more entrance there. And um, and so presumably, especially as you're getting into these much larger organizations, like they're being, they're probably pretty thought flyers. It's not like they're just doing it on a lark or whatever. Like they're doing an actual RFP or RFP light or whatever. Like they're doing a purchase process. And so when when you think about um, kind of influencing um, decision criteria and and that, um, how are you coaching your reps to 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 do that? Um, and and make sure that like the, the RFP or the decision criteria points directly at launch darkly. Yeah. Yes. And you know, Pete, it, it that is the importance of AE outbound, right? Like every salesperson in the world would love to sit back and say, you know what, marketing, you just give me all the leads and I'll work them. Right. But, but the best sales reps get in early before that RFP, uh, and they're talking to customers about their testing and their. Um, their release process and, and the effect on their and really good salespeople through a series of questions can make the unique differentiators about their product important to their customer and make it yep. seem like it's the customer's idea. So, Mr. Customer, tell me about, you know, in our case, tell me about technical debt. How's your product? from? Oh, we've got this debt. And so a feature flag management system that helps you deal with technical debt would be important to you, huh? See, I just said, why don't you make this important? But then the customer goes, yep. And then when you sit in front of the ec economic buyer before the POB, you're like, this is important because my product has a particular, uh, Launch Starkly has a particular like way of getting rid of technical debt, which is something that's a differentiator for our product. But like, unless you can really make that important to your customer through a series of questions, that's why it's a, it's a really important to be first in the door. And I love um, inbound leads because they convert at a very high, high rate. But what we normally see is reps reach out, there's a little bit of interest. Customer says, close, not now. Fine. Six months later, the, 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 your, your champion's emailing you saying, do you have a list of decision criteria I can put in the RFP? Sure. Let me write that for you. Here you go. And all of a sudden you've locked out all your competitors. And if you wait for marketing to let that deal drive to you, the customers right. usually have done all their research in advance. They've already made up their mind about what's important to them rather than ha you having the conversation about things where you can plant questions and get them thinking and then throw it all back at them. Here's what you thought was important. Oh, and these four things are important too, huh? Yep. Okay. Only we can do those four things. That is interesting. So, and I think, is is that something that you guys do in the sales organization or is that something that product marketing has kind of helped out with where it's like, hey, look, these are the key differentiators as compared to, I'm trying to remember the competitors that launched Darkly as like Switch or, or whatever it's right. like, uh, yeah, or or uh, optimizely has like a little like it's you know it's it's like new or whatever, and so do your reps kind of like know what the the key differentiators are such that they can then be like, cool, let's like ask probing questions that like point directly to those differentiators. Mm, mixed. Yeah, we not as we would, we, we we would like them to. <laughs> yeah, that's something that we're working with force management on in, in Q one is is really honing in on what are the key five to seven things that we know that we do better than our competitors. Yeah. 
and then that's so yeah the way that, so uh, as as somebody who used to be a product marketer myself um the way that i'm just like religious about like plowing things back into disco questions and just making mm -hmm. sure that the 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 discovery questions the yeah. like ever the evergreen disco question list is like is is always um kind of like up to date tip of the branch right yeah. and so like either a um as as like other markets or as like movements happen in the market and maybe like somebody gets acquired and then like usually that's kind of like the death knell for innovation there or alternatively you ship more features that actually make something like more different like a good example of this would be yeah. that um we recently integrated with like gong right atrium um organizations can can visualize and goal on um and you know set alerts on uh, a bunch of their their gong data in in yeah. atrium and so previously we we didn't really have a, a disco question around like how you do conversational intelligence or whatever but now we add one which is like hey how do you like how are you guys doing conversation intelligence right now oh we use chorus oh we use gong wonderful like so are people actually like listening to those calls or did you find that like it's kind of one of those things that you wish you had more time to do and you know, or, um, but you don't get around to, oh yeah, no one ever listens to it. But like, we'd love to understand how people are tracking on these behaviors over time. Okay, cool, well, we'll get back to that, right? And so um, like making sure that those trap questions are in there in, in yep. Disco, but that, but even as like new, sh new stuff ships, getting it back into the Disco update. questions. Yeah, how do you update? In fact, you know, we use, use Gong and, or we use Chorus. I, I, yeah. Um, and we actually just put a tracker together that in the name of the sentence that the rep has to say is what has the, what was the impact to your business? So when I they talk it. about shipping stuff that doesn't work, the rep's supposed to say, and then across a quarter, I'm going to be looking and, and, and the best thing about it is on Monday, I've got an all employees call and I'm going to let everybody know, like at the end of the quarter, you should have, you, you should be a part of this graph. If your name isn't on the graph, it means you haven't asked that question. We have bigger problems to deal with. And you know what, just like when I was doing my champion building, and one of the questions on there is like, do you know their kid's name, their dog's name? Now, when any yep. dog barks in the background, my reps automatically are like, what's your dog's name? And now they kind of laugh, but you know what? It encouraged them to be do something different that they you, wouldn't you, do. You, habit, you habituated to it by like continuing to roast them on it and make yep. sure that it's like, it's like, well, I, I guess that um, this is very PTC, very forced management, like the notion of mantras. Right. Like, because like making sure that you're always like, it, it's funny. I, each of our departments has their own mantras. Cause like, I'm terrible. So what I do is I like, in, I infuse this stuff in different parts of our organization. So we have like, we have our SDR mantras, we have our AE mantras, we have our CS mantras as well. Hasn't gotten into the, the engineering organization quite yet. Um, we'll see, maybe I'll like infect them um, as, <laughs> as well. But, but what ends up happening is like you, you, you show the data, or you, sorry, you set an expectation. Hey, the reason why we're doing this, like we're supposed to be talking about impact, we're going to instrument that through, mm -hmm. you know, through 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 chorus. Or we're going to instrument, and then you know, we'll we'll get you that integration here in the coming quarters. But like, and then we can visualize it uh, in in Atrium, and then you habituate it and make sure that people are talking about it in and meeting. It. You got to publish it once in a while, right? Because every no one wants to be on the bottom of the graph. Yeah, if you just say it in team meeting and then like you never bring the graph up again or you never, you know, you never habituate and you don't, you don't actually, you know, talk the mantra, then it's kind of like in one ear out, like it's actually, well, A, in one ear and out the other. And then moreover, if you don't ever like harp on the program and like actually see a program through to through fruition, then you end up training your reps where it's just like, oh yeah, like whatever Pete says, like that's just flavor of the week. Like that's not going to happen. Right. Yeah, I'm just saying, pick one you, thing and stick to it for a while. Right, and I think that's what you said earlier is that previous um, your your the the previous kind of coaching emphasis, um, for or like team wide coaching emphasis was all around um, was around champion development, right? And then and then now you're moving towards EB and <clears throat> and decision criteria. Um, how I actually maybe like maybe we could talk about this a little bit like because so much of what we were talked about with respect to EB access. And then, um, and then decision criteria um, influence, I guess. Um, the way that you do both of those things is by having a, a strong champion. So that's kind of like the high order bid. It's the, right? So um, what are some of the ways that you um, kind of coach champion development for your for your teams? I mean, obviously there's knowing the dog's name, but like what else? Well, I mean, I have a whole list of, of questions, but mostly it's about, it's about, you know, you, you build that first kind of 
relationship as a contact, right? You, they respond to your emails, right? Um, your, your second part of that is more like them coordinating meetings. And after you've done all the pleasantries, you got their cell phone, whatever, you know, there, there's literally a list of questions and it's in, I have a champion call score sheet and it's yeah, asking them things Love like you know, if the champion, if, if our product may, if our product succeeds and you go from two releases a month to one release a day, what happens to you? Do you know? And, and I think it's really, the, the reps used to use it in a very reactive way. So they knew that they were doing a med pick review. They knew that I was going to be on the med pick review. They knew I was going to ask their champion score. And so they went and calculated it. And that was a good first step. But what I wanted them to do, and now they're doing more so, is, oh, I've got a meeting with, you know, Pete on Thursday. I'm going to go to my Pete champion score. And I'm going to say, you know what? Here's 20 okay. points I can pick up. I'm going to find out what Pete's dog's name is. Joke, right? right? But I'm going to ask Pete these hard questions. Whatever. I'm going to ask Pete for that EB meeting. I'm going to ask Pete if I can help him prepare the internal slides. Um, I'm going to ask Pete to participate in a BVA, a business value assessment, with a right to see if he will. Um, but you yeah. got to do all that base stuff before you can ask those second level questions. You have to earn the right to ask EB to take you to their or your ch your champion to actually take you to the EB. So right. um, moving forward, it's about taking this, the champion score sheet and looking at all the stuff that is still a no on there and picking the gap up analysis. Yeah. To use it proactively to figure out how am I going to get a champion score of 70? Don't surprise yourself by going, oh, shit, I got a good champion score. It's not how it's supposed to be used. Right. It doesn't like just it doesn't just happen. It happens through good pre-call planning and saying, hey, what are the things that are missing? It's fascinating because it's like it's almost like what you want to do is you want it's like. Med pick is on the op, but then you want to be able to do this on the contact and and make sure that like you're you're checking these things off, but but not in a willy nilly sort of fashion. Think about like, hey, from a pre call planning standpoint, what am I trying to achieve here? Like, what is my ideal exit from this conversation? What are we trying to achieve here? But then breaking it down granularly, there there is like, what's the thing that we're trying to do on the deal? Right. And like kind of like absent med pick things or whatever. But then it's almost kind of like open that up. And then you have all these like contact criteria that are, um, you know, that are missing or, you know, absent or whatever. And then like you set your intention in order to in order to do that. Um, that's still all in a in Google um, in a Google sheet. Right, Tammy, like yep. your reps are working out of that. Yep. I can send yep. you. Send you a copy of it, anonymize, you know, it with influence yeah. and authority. Does your, does your, does your champion have influence? Do they have authority? And then here's the basic, you know, have they returned your emails just one-on-one -on -one, or is there always like people copied on them? And then it gets yeah. to the second like level. And then the third level, which is the bottom, which is the real champion building. I shouldn't call it champion. It's kind of a champion score sheet, but it really should be like a champion plan. Yeah. yeah. That's so, that, that, literally, that's what I was thinking. I was like, it's an account plan, but for human. Yeah. Right. Yeah, totally. Um, there's a really good question here from Kathy around, um, you know, what are some ways, what are some successful ways for planting decision criteria to differentiate? I think we kind of talked about it a little bit um, earlier, but what are some like really tactical ways um, to, um, to, what are some tactical ways to, to plant those, those decision criteria um, to make sure that that's happening? Yeah, I think we talked a little bit about it, but you know, to me, it's about asking the right questions and guiding the conversation by asking questions. But it's almost like your customer doesn't even know that you're doing it. You're making it your idea, but they don't even realize. So, totally. so if you ask about technical debt, right, and they go, you know, yeah, we have some, what's the impact been, right? How do you think a feature flag management system is going to add to that technical debt in the future? What do you think your technical debt's going to look like in two years if you're not able to automate the removal of flags? Until all of a sudden they went from, I don't really care about removal of the flags to, holy shit, if I don't remove those flags, I'm going to have real messed up, like ton of code in the future. It's going to suck. And so, so all of a sudden it becomes their idea to automate yeah. the removal of flags. And you're like, so when you, when you put up the list of here's the technical requirements to meet your desired state, that's on there. And they're like, yep. And you remind them of that every time you meet with them again. Right. Cause you, you, you brought them, you, you led them to it. I think, um, man, I took like, um, sh screenshots of this or f pictures with my iPhone while I was reading the qualified sales leader, the mm -hmm. section where he talks about the insurance salesman yes. doing like, doing like savage, savage disco with him, where it's just yeah. like, what happens yeah, if you so, boxed up, John? What happens <laughs> if you exactly boxed up? 
<laughs> yeah, box up. Well, I'm not going to say die, but you know what I mean. Yeah. And then, like, it's such for anyone who hasn't read the qualified sales leader, like, literally, that yeah. just like that little section right there more is, your, is your dog. What do you call them? Your dog marks? I forget what. Yeah, I think amazing. More, yeah, I love it. Yeah, it's it's so great, and I think one of the things that's really that reps oftentimes struggle with though is is going like four or five questions deep on disco on a single topic because mm -hmm. what they'll do is they, they kind of treat it like a checkbox right like oh like how are you doing feature flagging right now okay great how are you doing um you know how are you doing continuous integration you know um how are you like what's your what's your what's your what's your build system or whatever versus like when they get a little piece of pain asking the next and then the next and then the next and then the next and your I, business yeah and i feel that a lot of that is oftentimes because like reps are nervous and they're not like they're, they're not, not like listening. yeah I, totally but like oftentimes it's because they're like nervous and they're like not um secure in their skin mm -hmm. if you will um and obviously like this is where enterprise reps highly differentiate as compared to um kind of like junior you know, SMB or like mid-market reps where they're like, they're comfortable having like a real, like a, a serious business conversation and not like they're comfortable with silence. They're comfortable asking these kind of these, these like pointed questions. Like, yeah, what happens if you get boxed up? <laughs> right. Yeah. Yeah. Now, <laughs> and, you, you got a guy that all he was worried about, John McMahon on that day was his rep from Chicago, who's going to be calling him on a deal update. And all of a sudden you shifted his attention span to what if I get boxed up? What happens to my wife? What happens to my kids? You know, he came on one of my team calls and I asked him, I'm like, so John, did you buy the insurance? And he skirted the answer. He wouldn't tell me yes or no. <laughs> anyway. Yeah. And so, and, and so I wonder, I wonder how, like, this is one of the things that I could struggle with kind of the joke I like to say is like, how do you install backbone? Like, how do you install backbone into reps? Cause, um, and I don't like, uh, like, I think the answer to that is like lots of repetitions and lots of like trial and error and what have you. How do you have kind of approaches to like help them get comfortable around like persisting and going next, 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 next? Um, yeah, well, so the first strategy there would be the, the chorus tracker that we're doing. What is the impact to your business? Sure. Because, you know, making it a habit with them. But um, there is a book I'm reading. It, actually, I'm really reading it right now. It's, it says it's how to listen with intention. Hmm. And it's about, you know, listening to truly listen to people, not listening to check a box. When reps are new, I recommend they have the dis discovery call score sheet because, you know, to John's book, what, you need to measure things so that you can improve them. And if you can't measure them, you can't improve. So I have a, I have a tracker for everything. But like that, yep. how to listen with intention. Um, mm -hmm. I think it's about being people being comfortable in their skin. And I am kind of not a fan of having that discovery call score, like the questions in front of you, because I think that instead of listening to your customer, you're reading the next question. Yeah. 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 But then the problem of course, is that like, so then you gotta be the, the reps gotta have them in their head fully yeah. in some sort of capacity. And then it just becomes this choose your own adventure situation. Yeah. It's tough. Um, I, I like, yes, I'm, I kind of go back and forth around it. Where like on the one hand, you'd like them to have it be having, I, I guess the worst example of this is like when people use slides in a disco conversation, um, because then they're just like, it oh. just leads them to like show up and throw up. Um, Thank and you. so I guess, yeah. yeah. And, like I think uh, my buddy Corey Bray talks about this all the time. Is like as soon as the slides come out in in disco, like you know that it's going to be a problem. And I yeah. guess like a disc a set of questions kind of has a little bit of the same sort of thing where like you're being scripted. But on the flip side, like you don't want the rep to like miss important things, and and sometimes they do, especially when you're talking about like you know 28 year olds or or what have you. Um, yeah, I guess there's like not really an answer. It's just kind of like a two-edged sword there. You know, um, one uh, discovery call I listened to that had a, that had slides in it that I didn't mind, and the reason is the slides had a bunch of quotes from customer pain. Like mm. the slide had a quote that said, "You know, our release process is is broken, and we release code too early." And and he's and all of them had different. Like we have no way to do a canary or pointed launch. And he put it up, and the customer. And then he just said, this is what we've heard from other co customers. Do, does any of this resonate with you? And it was like this silence. And as they read them all, and it was so, yep, they're like, that one does, that one does. Oh yeah, that's happened to us. And he's like, tell me more. What's the impact to your business? 
That was the yeah. only that was the only slide I've ever seen um, presented during a discovery call with that I liked. Yeah, and it, I think this is something. So one of our board members, a gentleman named Brett Queener, um, I think uh, who used to run sales operations at uh, at Salesforce, and he and I were talking about this um, the other day around how like, and you guys will probably do this with force management where <clears throat> at a certain point what ends up happening is like you harmonize on like the five or the, you know, the seven like things that organizations like really, really care about. I think force calls in like value drivers or something like that. Mm -hmm. um, and like, you can just kind of pop them up there and it's like, cool. So which of these are you? And it, get, it actually can do a really good job of like a facility. So like right. they read them all. It's like, it's like one, three, and seven. It's like wonderful. Now I don't have to take you through all seven and be like, does this one apply? Does this one apply? Does this one apply? Does this one apply? It's like, cool. You said one, three, and seven. Great. Let's talk about the impact of one. Let's talk about the impact of three. Let's talk about the impact of seven. Actually, one one thing that we've done um, is we actually do um, we do a pre-disco uh, email um, where literally we have those like multiple use cases like an atrium use cases. That's cool. Yeah. Um I forget whose idea it was. It I think it was one of my reps. And then the SDR so the SDRs actually do it. What they do is like ahead of the meeting, or actually it's it's right after the meeting books. They'll just be like, hey, you know, just to facilitate the conversation, you know, these are the things that we hear from our customers a lot. Like it's like how do you like you know which of these things are a priority for you? Tracking the, you know, tracking the ramp of reps, managing um uh, you know, managing your your um, your seller, your AEs, and your SDRs using goals. You know, pipeline hygiene. It's like a whole list, right? And so, what people will do is sometimes they'll come back and they'll be like, "Oh yeah, like uh, you know, two and six is really important." So sometimes it'll be like really brief, like that, but at least it guides the conversation. And sometimes people will come back with these like paragraphs. Yeah, and it's really telling, isn't it? We did that not before a discovery yeah. call. But we had a, a really large demo. There was like a hundred people on it. And oh you know, for 100 people, you're not going to get any real Q&A and back and forth. But we sent a, a survey before and, you know, yeah. only 10 people like actually responded. But it like three of the responses that it, it pretty much read, I'm your champion. Like, I'm just going to let you know right now, I'm your champion. They've used feature flags. They had the use cases. They put a lot of detail in there about how the use cases would be pertinent to their company. Um, and it was uh, it was just a great best practice. That is fascinating. Essentially, it's like because party calls suck, right? And because like no one's, yeah, like no one's gonna speak up. Um, there's all, you gotta you gotta control the hell out of it, et cetera. But at least in this case, what you're doing is you're like smoking out the people ahead of time. It's almost kind of like giving a lecture in school, right? right? Where you're just like, and it's like, and I know, and I, and I think that Frank might have the issue here. Right. Blah, 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 blah. And then everyone's like, oh, okay, Frank. Yeah, yeah, Frank's legit. Okay, great. Yeah, got it. That's a really interesting idea. So essentially, it's just like a pre-disco survey um, associated with, um, you know, like, obviously, that was like a mega party call demo thing. But you could totally imagine doing that when you have, like, sit, like, use us as an example. Oftentimes, we'll get dragged into these larger deals where there's, like, you know, six sales managers involved who will ostensibly be the user of Atrium. And, like, you can't do, like, runtime disco with each of them in the in the, in the in the party call because it'll just be, like, a disaster, right? So you can right. do it ahead of time with a little bit of, like, you know, a little bit of um, asynchronous. That's so that's so fascinating. Um, I think about how good it made them feel. Like you, like when you send a survey out to each of the six managers and ask for their opinion, it makes them feel like you're asking for their opinion. Yeah, that's a really great point. So it's like pre-disco. I'm writing this down, Tammy. I love it. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um, okay. The um, I think one thing. Um, so uh, Kathy had a a, <laughs> a a cool question here about, and we were talking about like mechanisms by which to get in front of the economic buyer earlier. But yep. I think like in a situation where the champion is hesitant to get you in front of EV, um, is the, are there ways to get in front of the, the economic buyer anyway? Or is that almost just like a sign that you have a weak champion and, <laughs> and like you need to find another another champion or is it kind of like both? I think it's kind of both. I think there are ways, like I think we had mentioned earlier, if the customer is looking to go beyond a two-week POV, well, you have to meet your executives. I'm sorry, Mr. Customer, I have no control over it. My executives will not sign off 
unless they meet with your executives to define if there's you know a reasonable opportunity to do business together at the end. So if I think the what reps miss is some reps just will do anything a customer asks. I need this discount, okay. I need net 60, okay. And they view their job is to take what their customer needs and go to finance and say, can I have net 60 on this? But they don't say, well, yeah, yeah. I mean, they're not, you're not a go between. Put yourself and put yourself as a representative of your company. So first thing to do is push back. No, I don't think I can get that done. But by the way, if I have any chance of getting that done, if you could let your executives meet with my executives to give them visibility that this is a real deal, my chances are a lot higher when you make that happen. So sometimes you can make yeah. and be looking for signs of things that you can say it's out of my control or it would really help if I could get this meeting set up. Then I bet I can get you what you want. Right. So essentially it's like ways of, of mo ways of catalyzing the, 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 or helping the champion surmount his or her fears or reticency or or what have you is anytime you like hear an ask, you just like grab that ask and then like and then hold it back. Yep, you right? want like, I I would love to, I would love to. They were up to right? me. I would do it for you. I can't. Yeah, I just, I, but I'm just little old me, right? Yeah. I got this mean boss. Her name's Tammy. Yeah. She's got this like really cool biker jacket. You just don't mess with her, right? Throw me on the bus. She won't approve it. Nope. She just won't. I can ask her. She, she won't. won't. She's mean, mean yeah. sales leader. No, I, I wish. Um, yeah, yeah, I love it. Well, um, so Tammy, I think we're we're kind of up on time here, but as usual, this was like super rad. A, a bunch of amazing gems completely unsurprising for somebody who has been at this for so long. I mean, amazing champion development, uh, EB, EB access, EB <clears throat> persistence, um, decision criteria development stuff, like all sorts of wonderful, wonderful things. This is exactly why we do this, right? Because now people are walking away with like all sorts of very, very tactical things to, to apply in their own kind of upmarket sales motions. Um, I am going to be looking for, I'm going to put a reminder on my calendar to touch base with you in a, in a couple quarters to hear how the commercial stuff is going, because that'll be really exciting. Um, that'll be really exciting for you. Um, but uh, but yes, thank you very much. And then for everybody else, thanks for for joining us. Next week we have Connor Fee, who's the CRO at Shortcut, used to be Clubhouse. So that so it's going to be a um, we're going to be talking about um, technical sales, right? Selling to the selling to an engineer, not dissimilar to launch darkly. In in Shortcut's case, it's a down market sale. It's a it's a PLG product, so like you know product led. A lot of a lot of that. Connor used to be the CRO at Clearbit as well, so it'll be absolutely fantastic. Um, so Tammy, thank you very much. Have a absolutely fantastic time in, uh, in Cabo and, uh, and have a good weekend. Okay. You too. Take care. Good to see you. Yep. Bye. Bye.